Well, hello there. Here we are with lecture number one. And as you will know from the syllabus of this course, in lecture number one, we are doing unit one, part one. Now, what's very nice about this is that this book, Interactions, is a follow-up to the interactions we used last course in 210. So I think all of you who have finished 210, you will see that we're following the same procedure. So as you see, now we begin our unit. This is unit one. And our topic in this unit is education and student life. Therefore, education is one of our vocabulary words, isn't it? Now let's see what we're going to be doing today. Now in this chapter, we have, as always, four sections. We begin with a conversation. Now before the conversation, we're going to introduce the topic, we're going to discuss some vocabulary, and we'll also look into perhaps some pronunciation issues like reductions or particular sounds. Then next time in lecture two, we go on to the second part where we have the lecture, the context, and the task. So that's what we have ahead of us today. So let's get started. Education and student life, our conversation is going to be about on a college campus. I believe we had the word campus in the last course. The campus is the area of a university. Now, a university has buildings, a university has uh, labs and libraries, but the area is called the campus. Now, some large universities may have more than one campus. In fact, this university, King Faisal University, until recently had two campuses, one in Al Hassa, the Al Hassa campus, and one in Dammam, the Dammam campus. So that is the locale, that is the location of our uh, conversation that we're going to be practicing today. So let's move on. Later, next time, we'll look at the lecture, context, and real world task. That will be in lecture number two. This is from your book, and we have introduced the topic. We see two young people here. We see them in a room with a lot of different things pasted to the wall. One is handing a piece of paper to the other. We seem to have what are called bunk beds, one bed above the other. So that brings us to the questions at the top. These college students live together in a dormitory. Dormitory, one of our vocabulary words. The place where students live, student housing, is called dormitory. Some of you may know another word for this, a hostel, which is a more British term. This is more the American term. So please, another one of your vocabulary words. And we have the question, what do you see in the photo? Well, let's see what we have there. Well, we have two young students, happy and uh, of course, interested, as students should be. And one of them sitting at a desk, the other lying above at the top bunk of the bed, and they're exchanging some information. Many times in dormitories, students live together, two or three in the same room or the same apartment. And so we see a lot of uh, memorabilia there on the, on the wall, photos and pictures. When you're a student, you like to remember home. Huh? Probably those are pictures of family and friends and nice places that have been visited. Um, the next question is, what is good about living like this? Well, you have to tell me, but I'll, from my opinion, I think they expect you uh, to talk about how as students, if they live together, they can exchange their experiences, they have somebody uh, to talk to if they have a problem. There's always a danger of students living alone when they go off because they may get lonely. So at least you have company. The next question, what is bad? Well, people are people, and maybe you don't like some things about your roommate. Uh, maybe uh, she stays up too late at night, or perhaps uh, she uh, doesn't close the door properly. It's always difficult living with people. So. 
That's the bad side, good and bad. Now, next question, how and where do university students you know live? Well, you can only tell me that, and so I have to guess what you would tell me. Many of them here in Saudi Arabia live at home. Some of them rent an apartment, and some, if they're lucky, have college or university housing. So different possibilities. So this is about living at the university. And this is a transition to our conversation. Our conversation is between these two persons. The person on the right is a foreign student named Mari. Mari is from Japan. And the other person that she meets, as we'll hear in the conversation, is a teacher at the college. And her name is Nancy. And so that's what we're going to be hearing in the conversation. Now, let's read the, what we have above. In the following conversation, an international student meets an American teacher at a college campus. And that's what we're going to hear about. Now, please notice an important culture note at the bottom of your page. This is about the terms colleges and universities. Now, this book is an American book, so about colleges and universities in the U.S. In the United States, the words college and university can both refer to a four-year school after high school, a one that gives academic degrees. And that's how we understand it here with King Faisal University, or if you know King Abdulaziz University, these are colleges within a university. University has many colleges. It is, however, possible for a college to refer to a two-year school, one where you don't get a four-year degree and you take basic courses. So the word college, sometimes you have a college that's separate, like a teacher's college, or you have a university with many colleges. And please notice a vocabulary word here, degree. Degree means the level, a BA, a bachelor's, MA, a master's, these are all degrees. And so when you go to a university or college, of course your aim is to finish with a degree. In the case of the present college, you're talking about a bachelor's degree, and usually we use the abbreviation a BA, or if it's a master's, an MA. We'll look at that later. That will come up. All right, let's move now to our pre-listening questions. Now, we just looked at the photo of Nancy and of uh, Mari, and it says, describe what's happening. Well, if you look at the picture, you'll see that they are meeting each other. They're talking to each other. Uh, what are the women probably talking about? If you see the picture, we see Nancy holding her hand out. She's probably showing directions where to get to something. Number two, what questions do you usually ask a person you are meeting for the first time? Well, I can't tell you, but usually we ask their name, we like to know where they're from, what they do. If you're very, uh, what should we say, brave, you might ask, how old are you? <laughs> Not everyone will like that question. Uh, it all depends. If you like something very much, like music, you might ask, oh, do you like music? Uh, if you're interested in languages, you might. So these are many things we can ask when we meet someone. Uh, number three, when you are talking with people, how do you show that you are interested in what they are saying? For example, what do you say? Well, uh, usually we have what are called these transitional things that, oh, are really, hmm, oh, very nice. Uh, these are to show our interest, because if somebody just sits like this, and doesn't interact, it sounds like you're not interested. So usually, now it says, what body language do you use? Well, the usual, oh, we should nod our head. Mm, oh, we should, <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, so this is all part of communication, isn't it? Not necessarily language in the normal sense, but that's part of communicating. And that is important. It is important how you uh, behave when you talk. 
And finally, number four, what are some ways of asking for directions in English? Ah, huh. well, where is the post office? How can I get to the post office? Would you please tell me how I can get to the post office? Would you mind telling me? There are many ways to ask directions. How do I get there? Where is it? What can I do to get there? Now we move to part two. As you remember, we always have vocabulary in every unit. And here are some vocabulary that I, maybe you've prepared already in your textbook. In each of these items, one of them is underlined to indicate that this is our vocabulary. And in sentence one, we have sign up. Our sentence is, I'm going to sign up for an exercise class at the gym. Sign up. You look at the choices, and you should have chosen D, to register, put your name down, or to join, to become a part of. Huh? So please notice these verbs, sign up, register, join. Number two underlined is major in. Number two, she's planning to major in art at the University of Washington. Now, major in, the correct choice is C, to focus or specialize in a particular ta subject at a university. Now, since you are taking this course, I believe you are probably majoring in English. Otherwise, you're maybe in the wrong course, I think. Anyway, that's my idea. I think everyone taking this co uh, course is majoring in English. We come to number three. Now, this is, as a note, somewhat slang. It's not used in formal language to be into something. Am into. There are sentences, I don't like classical music but I am really into jazz. To be into, and we've chosen B, to like or to love. Now notice the word noted there, slang. Slang is an important word to understand. Slang means language that some people don't consider to be appropriate. Now, some slang is worse than others. So this is not something you would use if you're giving uh, a lecture. I would never write to you or say to you as a teacher, I'm into Shakespeare. I'd say I'm very interested in, uh, I am very much engaged by, I find Shakespeare fascinating, but I would not say I am into. This is a bit slang, very informal. So please note this word slang. And finally, number four, our underlying term is to get ahead. Now, get ahead, we've chosen here A. You have to get a good education if you want to get ahead in life. So in this context, get ahead means to succeed. This we call an idiom because it has a special meaning. Huh? It doesn't mean literally. If you say get ahead, for example, if I'm in a line waiting, I could say to get ahead. But here it means to succeed in a more general sense. So we say this is an idiomatic use of get ahead. And our final sentence, we have underlined a very important word for us to discuss. And this is the word career. The sentence is, she has a successful career as a fashion designer. Now the choice we have made is a profession or a job. But I want to make very clear to you, there's a bit of a difference between profession, job, and career. A job is anything you do for money. Sometimes uh, we need money, we do something we don't even like, and this might be a job. A profession is usually something requiring background, like to be a teacher, to be a lawyer, to be a doctor, you need, and so we call that a profession. We would probably never call someone who works in McDonald's uh, that we would say he has a profession, unless he's the manager. Now, what about career? Career indicates over a long period of time. And so, if you do something for two or three years, that's not a career. A career is almost like a lifetime commitment. 
And so some of you may look forward to a career in business, some of you in teaching, some of you perhaps in art, all of these, but it implies you do it through the extent of most of your life. I can tell you at my advanced age that I have very much enjoyed my career in teaching. I really don't regret it at all. So if you're thinking of teaching, I do suggest it. I do highly recommend it. Uh, keeps you young, as you can see. All right, uh, enough of the personal references. All right. Now, uh, you're going to now hear this conversation between Mari and Nancy. You have to pretend a bit, because I don't sound like Mari and I don't sound like Nancy. But I'm sure you have a lot of imagination and can do it. Now, here are the things you should be trying to hear. One, where are they going and why? Who is Nancy and what does she do? Who is Mari? Where is she from? How did Mari learn to speak English? Why does Mari need to take an English course? And what does Mari want to major in? Now, you're going to hear the conversation. I'm going to turn this over to symbolize the fact that I want you to listen and not be reading. So now your concentration should be totally upon listening, because you're going to hear the conversation now and try to remember as much as you can so that you can answer those questions. Okay? Here we go. We start with Mari. Mari. Excuse me, could you tell me where Kimball Hall is? Nancy. Oh, uh, you mean Campbell Hall. Mari. Oh, yeah, right. Nancy. Do you see that brown building over there? Mari. Uh, uh, behind the fountain? Nancy. Yeah, that's it. Come on, I'm going there too. Are you here for the English placement test? Mari. Yes, I am. How about you? Nancy. Actually, I'm one of the English teachers here. Mari. Oh, really? Maybe I'll be in your class. Nancy. It's possible. What's your name? Mari. Marika Honda. But most people call me Mari. And you? Nancy. I'm Nancy Anderson. So where are you from? Mari. Japan. Nancy. Aha. And how long have you been here? Mari. Just three weeks. Nancy. Really? But your English sounds great. Mari. Thanks. That's because my family used to come here every summer to visit my grandmother when I was little. I can speak pretty well. Nancy. Hmm. Mari. But now I want to go to college here, so I need to improve my skills, especially writing. Yeah, so you, that's why I signed up for this English program. Nancy. I see. Uh, what do you want to major in? Mari. International business. My father has an import-export company, and he does a lot of business here in the States. Nancy. Oh, I see. Mari. And I also want to take art classes, because I'm really into art. Nancy. Art and business. Wow, that's an interesting combination. But uh, can't you study those things in Japan? Mari. Well, sure, but you have to speak good English these days to get ahead in business. It's better for my career if I go to college here. Well, here's Campbell Hall. Good luck on the placement exam. It was nice meeting you, Mari. Sorry about that interruption. Thanks, you too, Nancy. See you later. Mari, 
Bye bye. All right, sorry about that glitch there. But I think from listening, now you will be able to answer these questions, I hope. This is the type of thing you'll be doing in your homework and also in the exam. Where are the women going? Now, if you're choosing answers, restaurant, post office, Kimball Hall, service station, swimming pool, you'd of course use Campbell Hall. They're going to a placement test. And why? Well, they're going for the English exam. And placement is an important word for us. Placement means putting you at the right level. Huh? When you take an English course, it might place you as beginning, advanced beginning. This is placing you. The exam is a placement test, one of our vocabulary words. Number two, who is Nancy? Well, I hope you heard. She's an English teacher at the college. What does she do? She teaches English there. Number three, who is Mari? And where is she from? Well, Mari is a student from Japan. How did Mari learn to speak English? I hope you heard that she came often to the United States when she was little because her grandmother lived there. Uh, so next question, why does Mari need to take an English course? Well, she wants to study in America. And what does Mari want to major in? International business. So that is our conversation, listening to it for general information. Now we move on to the aspect we call this intensive work, where we're now looking at this in detail. And I'm going to reintroduce the word stress. In spoken English, important words that carry information, such as nouns, verbs, and adjectives, are usually stressed. This means they are higher, louder, and spoken more clearly than other unstressed words. Stress is an important part of correct pronunciation. Listen to this example. We have one, two, three, four, five, six words, but only two have stress. Listen. Good luck on the placement exam. You hear luck on the placement exam. Those are the words with stress. Now, your exercise here is to fill in according to what you hear. And we had the conversation, and we had, excuse me, could you tell me? Notice E-L-L, -L, be very careful, e -eh, tell. Nancy says, oh, you mean Campbell Hall. Now, I know this is a name. I will not test you on a name. But notice, she said Kimball, and it should be Campbell. Mari, oh yeah, right. Do you see that brown building? These should be rather, please notice, uh, Mari says, ah, behind the fountain. Notice the suffix, A-I-N. We have many words like this, mountain, certain, fountain. Please remember that, the spelling. Oh, yeah, that's it, come on, I'm going there. We have the important word placement. Yes, I am. How about you? English teachers, your class. It's possible. Please notice P-O-S-S-I-B-L-E. What's your name? Mario Kohanda, but most people. Be careful here. Many students confuse must, which is a verb, and most. So here, most, adjective. Nancy, I'm from Japan. How long have you been here. Now we have to talk about something here. This past participle is pronounced differently by different people. Some people say, how long have you been here? How long have you been here? How long have you been here? All of them are correct, so please get used to any of these three. Three weeks, your English sounds great, meaning very good. Please notice the spelling with E-A. Thanks, that's because my family used to come here. Now, English family usually means a group of people. A family, a man and a woman alone are not considered usually a family. A family usually has children in English, okay? And when I was little, 
and I can speak pretty well. I don't think any difficult words there. And then we come to the uh, remainder of the of this close exercise. College, one of your important words. Huh? College, usually part of a university, also could be a small institution on its own. Writing with one T. English program. What do you want to major in? M-A-J-O-R, remember, specialize, huh? to major. And she says, international business. Please notice that this comes from the word busy with ness, but it has a special pronunciation. We don't say busyness, we say business. Huh? And he does a lot of, huh? a lot of, very much business. I also want to take art classes. I'm sure art, in this case, means painting and drawing, art, because I'm really into art, really into one of our vocabulary. But can't you study those things in Japan? She says, I have to speak good English these days to get ahead in business, get ahead, huh? remember, to succeed. It's better for my career if I go to college here, meaning in the States, because they're speaking in the United States. Nancy says, here's Campbell Hall, good luck. Uh, good luck when you want to wish people a good result on something, good luck on the placement exam. It was nice meeting you. All right, I hope you had no problems with those items. The next section is about reductions. Every unit we have reductions. In spoken English, words that are not stressed are often shortened or reduced. For example, we write, could you tell me where Campbell Hall is? But we say, could you tell me where Campbell Hall is? Now then, let me again tell you, this is in ordinary spoken English. If you are speaking in class, you're speaking to a group, speaking formally, you will say, could you? This is in rapid spoken informal English. But we do practice these reduced forms. They're a natural part of spoken English. They are not slang. However, reduced forms are not acceptable spellings in written English, and I'd like to add also in formal situations. So let's have a look now at some of the reductions that we are practicing in this unit. Please look at the top here. Could you tell me becomes, could you tell me where Kimball Hall is? Oh, you mean becomes, oh, you mean Campbell Hall? How about you comes, how about you? How about you? What's your name? What's your name? My family used to come here, becomes used to, used to come here. I want to go to college here, becomes I want to go to college. What do you want to major in? What do you want to major in? You have to speak good English these days. You have to speak good English these days to get ahead in business, to get ahead in business. Now, please remember, when you're tested, I'm merely asking you to interpret what you hear, not to make the reduced forms, exactly as we're doing in the next section. You would hear, could you please help me, please? I used to be a student at this school, and you should know used to would be written used to. B says, oh yeah, I remember you. How are you? A says, fine, thanks. B, can I help you with something? A, yes, I want to get an application for the TOEFL test. Wanna get becomes want to, huh? Wanna, want to. They used to be here on this shelf. I'm sorry, B. You mean the international TOEFL IBT? You mean, you heard you mean, becomes you mean. Let's see, uh, they used to be here on this shelf. Used to, used to. I'm sorry, you'll have to wait, have to wait, have to wait until they come in next week. How about you sending me one when they come in? How about you becomes, how about you sending me? And finally, B, no problem. What's your name? What you're going to hear, what's your, what's your name and address, huh? 
So these are reduced forms. You should be able to recognize them and supply the correct forms. Now our last, ex uh, in this lecture, our last task is to review the vocabulary. Reviewing vocabulary. If you are a college or university student, what is your major or what subject do you plan to major in? Well, that's rather easy because this course is part of the English major here at KFU, so all of you are majoring in English. You may have friends who are majoring in management or majoring in medicine. Number two, if you are working, what is your career or what career would you like to have in the future? Well, if you're studying English, you might have a career aim as a teacher, that's a teaching career, a career in business, a career in tourism, today tourism is growing. So all of these, but remember career implies over a long period of your life, not just for a month, a year, or a couple years. Uh, number three, is it important for you to know English if you want to get ahead in your career? Well, that all depends. Business, yes, you probably need to meet people and deal with people from other countries, so English is probably useful. It depends what your career is. Are you into art, like Mari? Well, I can't tell you, but all of you, I'm sure, are into something, maybe into poetry, uh, maybe into art, uh, maybe into sports. A lot of people here are into sports. To be into, meaning you like them very much. Number five, why did, why did you sign up for this English course? Well, I can't tell you that. Uh, probably you did it because you're looking to get a degree in English, but you may have other reasons. Are you going to sign up for another English course after this one? Well, I certainly hope you will sign up. I hope you'll continue taking English courses with us. And finally, using language functions showing interest. We talked about this before. English speaker, speakers show that they are interested in paying attention by making eye contact. You look at the person who's speaking to you. Usually we nod our head, um, mm, yes, you know, to show agreement. My students are very good at that, by the way. Uh, and sometimes we use words here, some of these expressions. Really? Yeah, I see. And, oh, oh, oh yeah, hmm, oh no, you know, and so showing engagement. That's ways of showing interest. Well, I thank you for showing interest today, and I look forward to seeing you next time. We'll continue on with the second half of Unit 1, where we go on to our conversation. Do you remember we talked about this earlier? Let's have a quick look and see what we're going to be doing next time. We're going to hear about undergraduate courses in North America. We're going to have some contexts about school and invitations. And our task is reading a map. So until next time, do prepare the, uh, the unit if you can, if you have the book. See you next time. Thank you very much.